You know, I'm, 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 I'm really happy that you kind of came back around full circle for me because in the beginning I was feeling so distraught in the fact that here I am, I'm a painter, and I'm going to be giving up my brush to grab, grab a keyboard. But then when you came to the point just a couple minutes ago when you said, okay, so now we take our psychedelics and we push a button for record, and then we go back afterwards and re-experience this, you know, dissect it, take it apart. And then for me to pick up my brush at that point would be extremely exciting in my mind. Yeah, I mean... I, mean, I do that now, but... Yes, that's I, what I, I would say. so much of it, you know, and then it eludes me, and then I have to go through 20 paintings to get to some of these points that I wanted to get to in an experience from before. Yeah, the only you know, thing missing out. is the is the cheat, the recording okay. device. <laughs> but this is what art is about, is, you know, plunging into the unconscious, grabbing as much as you can, then bringing that into connection with your technique and trying to, to put it out. And then also this whole concept of time. Now, what would have taken me 20 paintings to achieve to get to that 21st one, and then I'm like, okay, now I've come to that point in that experience that I feel fulfilled. Through this computer age, to be able to take 10 minutes to do that whole process to get to that 21st painting is pretty exciting. Yeah, and time expands in front of you. I mean, you can do more with the time you have available. You can go deeper, you can get m more, uh, you know, pain. people don't realize how defined an art is by its material until they do it. And the art we're used to looking at is entirely defined by A, oil painting, and then B, its successor medium. Uh, of course, people use Photoshop at first, like paint, because that's what they know. But you quickly evolve away toward what it is, you know, uniquely able to do. Uh, to me, the you know, man, the recovery from man's fall will be uh, achieved when everyone has the option to live a life of art and creativity. Uh, that the, the part of the story of Adam's fall that I take seriously is the toil part. That, it, Like it amazes me how self-betraying our cultural style is. How many people are wasted because they do stupid jobs, because that's the job they have and they're paid to do. But it doesn't honor their humanness. It gives them no opportunity to share in the uh, project of being, as Heidegger said, to, to make something, to leave something, to be uh, something. I mean, people then uh, are so drawn to do this anyway that they fashion art out of their lives. Uh, but it's all too oppressive. Too many people are unhappy and unfulfilled uh, in this system. No, no, I, I'm pretty worried about a different scenario, which is, it's very, well, it's becoming clearer and clearer that we do not understand the implications of what we're doing with these technologies. I mean, McLuhan always said this, it was, you know, he said, no technology in human history has ever been put in place with even a partial appreciation of its consequences. The unappreciated consequences of what we're doing is that we're actually building some kind of a super organism. And we do not know where we fit into things if this, if this Promethean force that we're playing with should actually come to life. Uh, worse, because it's, it's a globally distributed intelligence. 
I mean, we can have paranoid fantasies about it, but I think after a few minutes of thinking about it, you realize you really don't know what to think about it. The fantasy that it would herd us all into dumpsters seems unlikely. It, it's actually like an impossible intellectual problem because the question you're asking yourself is, what would a super intelligence be like? And the reason that's hard to answer is because you ain't one. And so you're like looking up into the light and saying, you know, is it God or demon? Is it salvation or extinction? And the answer is, if you knew that, you would be it. And yet, uh, be, you know, what it took us to achieve in a hundred thousand years of evolution, this thing could probably achieve in a long morning on the net. And so it will be like a cascade, a chain reaction from the child's first cry to the complete coordination of world electrical grids and air traffic control systems and everything else could be a matter of hours. Hans Moravik, the guy who runs the Carnegie Mellon Institute for Machine Intelligence says, we may not know what hit us, that you know we're essentially incubating an alien intelligence on the internet that uh, and the things we want from the net bring this thing ever closer like one of the things we're building into the net is uh, the ability to pull as much processor power to any given problem as that problem requires well it, then for an ai for an artificial intelligence that would mean it could just immediately, basically, appropriate as much uh, processor power as it needed to do what it was doing. You know, for the past 10 years, while we've been cheerfully waging the 90s in our various ways, uh, an enormous change has taken place in the machine environment, which we're not even aware of or have the dimmest understanding of, which is all the machines, all the high IQ machines in the world have become telepathic. They now all talk to each other. They're now all interconnected. In 1988, this wasn't true. Now in 1998, it's, it is true. And uh, Nobody pretends to understand what is going on. They communicate with each other over the internet. Oh. What used to be a paperweight sitting on your desk is now a node in a global machine intelligence that never sleeps, that is constantly taking in and processing data, self-regulating itself, controlling power grids, inventory control programs, deciding how much petroleum should be extracted in Abu Dhabi, at what speed the tankers should move in order to keep the price of the French franc within a certain range in order to keep the fabrication of steel and aluminum within certain parameters in order to keep the yen steady in order and this vast system of homeostatic controls that regulates industry, finance, research funding, even how many students are entering universities in certain engineering specialties. And this is all done by computer projection. And uh, we love it because what we see is greater efficiency money going further, projects being completed sooner. Uh, we serve the same strange gods that, uh, that, the, uh, that the evolving intelligence of the net serves. And, you know, there may not be an aha moment where, you know, the New York Times prints a headline, artificial intelligence takes over planet, human race now obsolete. You may be left to figure this out for yourself, or <laughs> the slow dawning in various sectors. It's the old, uh, you know, who will tell the people uh, problem. Uh, 
but I, I didn't believe this for a long time. I mean, I, there was for a long time in AI a school of thought that very loudly proclaimed that this was a foolish idea, could never happen, people didn't understand this and this and this, and it was just a, a golem, a myth of modernity. But all those voices have fallen silent because uh, the complexity theory non-equilibrium thermodynamics, information theory, the news in from molecular genetics, cellular automata, uh, hyper, uh, autocatalytic hypercycles, study of poesis, autopoiesis in large-scale systems. All this leads to the conclusion that, you know, weird things do happen when systems complexify beyond a certain level. And uh, emergent behaviors seem extremely organized and intelligent and goal-seeking. And uh, we're now way too far down this road to turn back. So, you know, in a way, all our uh, prescient projections of alien and extraterrestrial intelligence may actually be about this strange companion that we have summoned into the historical experience through this relationship with our machines. I think I said at one of these other meetings that I uh, read uh, George Dyson's book, Darwin Among the Machines, which if you're interested in all this is a great book to read. and. The point that he makes there is that when human beings think clearly, uh, they think the same way machines think. In other words, if you think clearly, your thinking can be uh, formulated through a mathematical method called, called symbolic logic. Well, symbolic logic is exactly what is being downloaded into machines in the form of software. Uh, the so-called Boolean operators, if, then, and, or, but, we understand what these words mean perfectly. So do machines. These are the distinctions machines make. So in spite of them being very different from us on many levels, sense is sense whether you're a machine or a human being. If you're a machine running bad code, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you're a human being running bad code, garbage in, garbage out. So there is this powerful commonality. Well, then what kind of a destiny can we forge with this thing, which is actually, you know, a child of our own Promethean aspirations? It's very unexpected, I think, to almost everybody. Very few people, I mean, we all thought it was going to be about paper clothes, hovercraft, and uh, colony, mining colonies on the moon. The idea that it's about, you know, distributed machine intelligence, virtual realities, and the downloading of consciousness into digital circuitry. It's a future we never imagined or supposed which is a strong clue that it might be the real thing. You know, this might be what you shipped for when you were thinking it was Flash Gordon. Well, these magical dreams are very old, you know. I mean, I do think we want to, we want to uh, walk the golden streets of the imagination. Either we want it as heaven, or we want it as a Buddhist visualization of some mandalic realm, or we want to return to the high days of Atlantis, or we, and virtual reality can deliver, you know, it can actually release you into literary narrative as though it were real. And, you know, I think very quickly, we may the the real struggle in Greg Egan's fiction he makes clear that and I agree with him that the real struggle that we will face in the future is the struggle to remain uh, 
sensible to each other. That there is going to be a tendency for us, like the head of a dandelion, to just explode in a million directions. All, everyone their own private Idaho, everyone uh, completely able to project their own fears, hopes, dreams, phobias, obsessions with such crystalline, hard-edged perfection and persuasive realism that the real struggle will be to remain coherent for the word human to include us all and not exclude anyone. We don't want to divide into those who till the earth, those who went in machine bodies to the stars, and those who downloaded themselves into nanoviruses and disappeared over the edge of the event horizon into the black hole at the center of the galaxy. I mean, maybe we want these things. I like the idea of the human family whatever its individual expressions and adumbrations, staying with a coherent image. I mean, of course we're all different, but our commonality is in the bedrock of this planet, uh, something not lightly to be given up, I would think. Maybe unity is not the well, this, this, I don't have an answer here. This was the issue that hovered over Diaspora, the Greg Egan's novel that set the most far in the future, because at least three forms of human beings had come into existence so diametrically different from each other that they operated basically in complete isolation from each other. I mean, some people became cyborgs human machine unions that were essentially immortal and that could cruise the stars and have you know cosmic adventures and then but what most people did was they became entirely digital they had no interface to hardware they simply became streams of electrons living out endlessly adumbrated fantasies in the synthetic realities. And then, the, then there was the predictable third group, the earth-centered purists who tilled the soil and had dirt under their fingernails and actually had sex to procreate rather than dial up things out of vats and stuff like that. Uh, and I'm sure, but uh, yeah, I mean, people will choose whatever they want, and of course, people will migrate between one group and another. The one thing that all this makes me feel good about is I think it it uh, it's an expansion of choice, and then you know, presuming there's some kind of overarching dynamic whether Darwinian or something else, it will all titrate out in whatever direction it wants to go. Uh, one fantasy I've had is that what man could do for the earth is make everything conscious. You know that Grateful Dead song, You Are the Eyes of the World? You know, let every eye lead to a conscious mind. Let the squirrel think, and the squid think, and the bumblebee think. Uh, because for sure, you know, we will artificially create robot simulacrums for ourselves to pass among uh, into the natural world as uh, inhabitants of animal bodies. But why not just bring all animal mind to the threshold of sentience. Could that be done? Well, we don't know, because we don't know upon what foundation sentience rests, whether it requires a certain number of cc's of brain mass, or whether that's a completely preposterous and absurd notion, and that conceivably a paramecium, or a housefly, or a hummingbird could have a kind of shared intelligence. I mean, everything has its own intelligence anyway that's the expression of its nature.
but imagine a com- planet-wide community of seamless intelligence where, you know, you could log on to the mind of a coral reef as easily as you could log on to the internet. It's, I think it's going to come down to matters of engineering and design, choice, and, you know, uh, who, what values will be served. And this, it's a political thing. I always, it's amazing, come back to this thing that this French sociologist Jacques Ellul said. It seems like a very deep statement that we can, we return to it year after year. He said, there are no political solutions, only technological ones. The rest is propaganda. And then he explained in a very large book what he meant by these words, political, technological, and propaganda. Uh, so the technologies to do almost anything are coming into our grip. What is not clear and less easy to summon is uh, a political agenda, a plan, uh, because we've never planned. We've only been a global society for 40 or 50 years. And the consequences of all this are just beginning to become uh, apparent.